The worldwide activities of the Lucius Trust, founded by Allison Foster Bailey, is dedicated to establishing human relations by promoting the education of the human mind towards recognition and practice of the spiritual principles and values upon which a stable and interdependent world society may be based. Like Alice Bailey, Sarah McKechnie is taking her professional and spiritual journey through life with her husband, Dale McKechnie, who is Vice President of the Lucius Trust. Sarah McKechnie, I can only imagine that you've been asked thousands of times to speak on the history of Lucius Trust founder Alice Bailey. But before I ask you to do this, I would like you to reach farther back into history and give us an overview of Alice Bailey's Russian mentor, Madame Helena Blavatsky, and why Bailey looked to her for inspiration. Madame Blavatsky, as she's called, or sometimes referred to as HPB, her initials, was a real pioneer in the um, bringing of what's called the ageless wisdom to the West. The ageless wisdom is a term for the spiritual teaching that for most of human history was hidden or veiled, but it's uh, it's like a, a golden thread that runs throughout the world religions and mythologies and has always been present in human consciousness in some form or another appropriate for the time. Then in about 1875, uh, a Russian woman, Madame Blavatsky, who had traveled extensively throughout the East and studied with spiritual teachers who were in remote locations in Tibet, in Egypt, deep in South America. She traveled all over, which was extraordinary for a woman in those times, wrote a work that's called The Secret Doctrine. And it was really fundamental in bringing the ageless wisdom into Western consciousness. Alice Bailey herself discovered the secret doctrine when she was living in California. Her own personal story is very interesting. She was um, a divorced woman with three small daughters to raise, and through a series of extraordinary events, she discovered the secret doctrine and was put in touch with two students who had studied personally under Madame Blavatsky. And so Alice Bailey became uh, deeply uh, engrossed in the study of the ageless wisdom and became an expert on the secret doctrine and began to teach it herself. So yes, you're right, Blavatsky was in many ways Alice Bailey's mentor, even though they never knew each other. Is it true that uh, Blavatsky's writings might have been plagiarized or at the very least served to inspire the recent best-selling book, The Secret? I don't know. I... I'm not terribly familiar with that book. I've heard of it. I think that some of the principles in the book The Secret are fairly well-anchored ideas that are really part of the ageless wisdom and therefore part of the library that humanity has been given. I I wouldn't use the word plagiarized, which suggests stolen. Just rephrased for modern man. I understand that both Madame Blavatsky and Alice Bailey's mothers died when they were young girls. And because death is life's greatest mystery that can't truly be explained, even though traditional religion attempts to do just that, do you think that the death of these women's mothers could have been the catalysts that set them on a path to esoteric study? That's an interesting question. I had never thought of it that way. Quite possibly it's true. Alice Bailey, in her uh, autobiography, which is called The Unfinished Autobiography because she died before she completed it, does talk about her childhood and Uh, In fact, she was orphaned. Both her mother and father died before I think she was even 10 years old. And uh, it was devastating for her, as it would be for any child of that age. She was passed back and forth between different parts of her family, and that had a big impact on her spiritual development because, as I understand it, every summer she would be shipped off to her grandmother in Scotland, who was quite a um, fundamentalist Christian. And Alice imbibed the fundamentalist Christian doctrine of her grandmother so deeply that as a young woman, she was very narrow-minded in her own words, a rabid evangelist, and went to India to preach the Christian doctrine to British soldiers in India. But as she discovered, they were more interested in um, drinking cocoa and playing chess with her than listening to sermons. 
expand on Billy's biographical data for me, that would be great, because I think it's a pretty interesting story she had. You know, her first husband and who was abusive, and that's the sort of thing that women are still dealing with today, to go on to become such a, a, a great and interesting woman. I suppose all of us are a product of our life experiences, and Alice Bailey certain, certainly was. She was an orphan. That's fundamental. She was born in the Victorian era of England. That's fundamental to her character. She was born to a life of privilege, and that also is fundamental. She never went to a school. She was tutored privately, and she had a first-class education and an incredibly well-developed mind, which became very important for the work she later did. She was, as I said, a fundamentalist Christian as a young person. Her experience in India when she was about 20, I guess, very young, very um, receptive to a totally different culture and way of life, really was the beginning of her spiritual revolution. She revolved, uh, you could say, turning from the narrow fundamentalist perspective to a, a spiritual consciousness, which became completely inclusive in her later years. She fell in love when she was in India with a British uh, officer in the British forces. He was not of her class. And at that time, that was a, a huge issue for them. The only way their families could deal with this mixed marriage, as they probably would have called it, was to send the young couple off to America. So her husband and Alice came to the United States. He studied to become a um, minister in what we call the Episcopal Church, the Anglican Church. Then they moved to California, where he had... Um, parishes in various small towns in rural California. They had three small daughters, but all was not what it seemed to be on the surface, because, as you say, he was an abusive husband. He had a violent temper, and um, I think the whole thing culminated with him throwing her down a flight of stairs, and uh, it was eventually concluded by the bishop who oversaw her husband's um, work that they had to live apart. Divorce at that time was just not sanctioned by the church, but um, there was no way that she could remain in that marriage. And that was at the beginning of World War I. So she was separated from her husband without any money, no access to the money of her family back in Britain due to the war. She became um, a worker in a sardine canning factory. And keep in mind that this was a, a privileged uh, woman from a very aristocratic background. What about you, Sarah? What was the catalyst that set you on your spiritual quest? I'd have to think back many, many years. I suppose it was um, something that grew out of an early aspiration to be of service. In my limited experience with people who have converted from traditional religions to more esoteric or New Age type practices, there's usually one thing each individual can pinpoint that made them have that aha moment and convince them to take up the new practice. Can you pinpoint something in Alice Bailey's teaching, one thing in particular that gave you that moment of awakening? I don't think I can. It was more of a gradual process of um, realizing that the mind has to be active if one is going to make any contribution to the world, that a, a willing emotional nature is not enough. And uh, the discovery of meditation, I would say, was pivotal. But I can't say that it was confined in a particular breakthrough realization, not in my case. So let me read something Blavatsky wrote, quote, It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god, and this without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity. Do you know what this really means, and do you think Bailey was so inspired by this sentiment that she named what has now been renamed or rebranded as the Lucius Trust, the Lucifer Publishing Company back in the 1920s? If I understand the statement of Blavatsky about Satan, that's another term for Saturn, which is one of the planets. In the um, study of esoteric astrology, there are, I believe, seven sacred planets. Saturn is the planet 
that is connected with the distribution or the working out of karma, the law of karma, which is really um, just another term for the law of cause and effect. It's utterly benign in its ultimate working out, even though karma can be painful to the individual undergoing the process. And that's why Blavatsky said Satan or Saturn is, um, well, how did you put it? It is Satan who is the god of our planet and the only god, and this without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity. Well, if I understand her, her language, without any elusive metaphor to its wickedness and depravity, she's saying not it's not necessarily associated with uh, wickedness and depravity as we normally think of Satan, the devil. Saturn is the planet of um, a karma, which is the great law of equilibrium, the restoration of harmony and balance. That's another way to look at cause and effect. It's the restoration of equilibrium, which can only be good. Now, the reference to Lucifer comes from Blavatsky's um, description of Lucifer in the accurate sense of the term, which is a Latin of Latin origin, it means literally light bearer, and it refers to a very obscure principle in the Ageless Wisdom, which is that the solar angels, the the governing lords of the world, descended to our planet eons ago, bringing the principle of mind to what was then in those ancient, ancient times, essentially animal man, human beings with no mentality at all, no soul, just virtually living the existence of an animal. And these solar angels brought the principle of mind. That's the connection with Lucifer, light bearer, bringing the light of mind to our world. So Lucifer to Blavatsky was one of the great sacrificial beings who descended to earth. That's where we get the idea of the fall, as John Milton, I think it was the British poet John Milton, wrote about the fall of the angels. That was the descent of the solar angels to earth as an act of sacrifice on our behalf. So you can see if you even have a willingness to consider this doctrine, how skewed it has been by the uh, more modern connotation of evil and Satanism and corruption. It's, it's not seen that way at all in the ageless wisdom. So Alice and Foster Bailey came out of the theosophical tradition, as I said. I believe Foster even was the editor of a theosophical magazine that they called Lucifer. So they probably thought Lucifer, light bearer, was a good name for their fledgling publishing company when they started to publish the books that Alice Bailey was writing, the books they saw as bringing light to humanity. But within two or three years, they decided to change the name of the company to Lucis Publishing Company. Lucis being from the same Latin term meaning of light, trust of light, publishing company of light, and that's the name we've had since about 1925. Did they get flack? <laughs> And that forced them to rebrand it. Not that I'm aware of. There's no record in our history of our work that um, explains why they changed the name. I have no idea why. It's only in more recent years with the Internet and this um, sharing of ideas, no matter how cockamamie they might be, that the Internet offers, that we hear more and more uh, from people who are concerned about our name. Anybody who's curious about it, you can go to our website, www.lucistrust.org, and you will find an article explaining the origins of Lucifer and the history of the Lucis Trust, and that should put it to rest. Are there any other characters that are just as wise and illuminating as Lucifer? Perhaps is there a feminine spirit that um, the Lucius Trust speaks about? Well, the feminine principle is um, embodied in people like Eve, Isis, and Mary, Mary being the mother of Jesus, Eve being the biblical wife of Adam, Isis being one of the um, rulers from uh, Egyptian mythology. Generally, the feminine principle in the Ageless Wisdom is 
equated with matter and matter according to blavatsky is spirit on its lowest level and spirit is matter on its highest level and the two are one it's not correct to see matter as uh, contaminated and um, evil and spirit as the only good the whole objective uh, especially in the coming age is to see the emergence of spirit and matter in perfect union so that life on earth becomes an accurate expression of god's plan as it exists in the mind of god to bring through that plan on earth is to merge spirit with matter the feminine principle is the receptive principle the masculine principle being the spirit or active agent but nothing is accomplished without the feminine principle carrying it through and bringing it to birth going back to i guess astronomy or astrology <laughs> or the blend of both Somewhere in my travels, I, I thought Lucifer was said to be a representative of the sun and Isis, the moon. Yes, I've heard uh, Isis equated with the moon. Here I'm showing my own ignorance. I really haven't studied um, this aspect that you've just brought up very deeply. Lucifer associated with the sun. Well, the name means light bearer. The sun is the source of light on every level of existence, not just in the physical sense, but in the spiritual sense. So that sounds logical to me. Uh, the Ageless Wisdom says that the solar angels, including Lucifer, came from the planet Venus, which is close to the sun, but more spiritually advanced than our planet Earth, apparently, bringing the principle of mind to man. The arcane school. Uh, this is kind of maybe being too simplistic, but could you give us a laundry list of what the teachings are. The Arcane School was um, one of two of Alice Bailey's um, spiritual contributions. The One of them was the writing of the 24 books of Ageless Wisdom, which are published over her name. The other was the uh, establishing of the Arcane School, which she began in the early 1920s and which exists still today. It functions as a correspondence school for students all over the world. Lucis Trust is a non-governmental organization that has an affiliation with the UN. How does your esoteric practice interface with the figures and policies of world government? It's a bit of a reaching question, <laughs> but I thought I'd give it a shot. That's all right. In some circles who don't know very much about our work, they have accused us of being in favor of a one-world government. That's not the case at all. We don't believe for a minute that there's any one system of government that would suit the whole world. Cultures and societies are different, and it's the right of nations to choose their own form of government. The term one world government is much more subjective in its significance in the books of Alice Bailey. It doesn't mean a political system that uh, nations would follow, but rather a kind of a spiritual view or perspective that sees the coalescing of all the nations of the world in unity. And that's what the United Nations stands for. People expect the UN to solve problems and take a stand, except when it comes to one's own nation, and then the UN should stay out of it. The UN isn't a form of government. It's a platform for the governments of the world to come together and try to work out in common ground a solution to problems. A fairly successful resolution might be the way they are approaching the problems in um, the Middle East that have been developing since the turn of the year. Although, again, not everybody would agree with, say, the stand taken in Libya or in Bahrain or whatever. But we have always supported the United Nations for its spiritual objectives, which are to provide a meeting place for the nations of the world to come together. There has to be some common ground if humanity is going to work its way out of uh, the problems of the world. And the UN is the best thing we've got. It's not perfect, but name one other global organization. You can't. We have to work with what we have. The UN is no better than its member states. And its member states are reflective of the consciousness of humanity in its present condition, which is imperfect. But let's say there uh, was such a thing as a new world order, one world government, globalist agenda, that sort of thing. Do you think the teachings of the arcane school would be the ideal teaching to bring out 
spirituality and what we would need to have a successful one world view well i would elaborate on that idea by not giving the arcane school the credit i would say the teachings or the principles of the ageless wisdom yes are enough to provide at least um, a template for the world to live in more harmony and unity those principles being a love of truth a sense of justice as being uh, something all human beings are in Title to a spirit of cooperation, a sense of personal responsibility on the part of every human being, and a realization of the goal being the common good, the good of the whole. Those are very generalized principles, but I would think that all intelligent, decent people could at least give lip service to to those principles i know you're not supposed to uh, lobby or interfere with any kind of political movements but have you uh been with the un for how many years is it oh i think the world goodwill has been affiliated with the united nations department of information probably from the beginning which was i think in the early 50s do you think Alice Bailey's teachings in any way might have influenced any of the secretary generals or the ambassadors? Well, I don't know if her teachings specifically have influenced them, but certainly the larger ageless wisdom has been, I think, um, influencing the consciousness, even back with the first secretary general, Dag Hammarskjöld. He was a deeply spiritual man. If you read his book, Markings, it's just full of spirituality. Uta Kant is revered even today for his deep spirituality. He was a practicing Buddhist, but utterly inclusive in his um, view of human beings and his openness to other spiritual truths. Robert Mueller, who was an undersecretary general for many years, again had a true global vision of humanity that was um, not confined by nationalist goals or objectives, he himself being the product of warfare in his home region of Alsace-Lorraine, which was torn between France and Germany. He knew personally how nationalistic thinking can cause such suffering. And probably there have been many other people in the UN who have been truly conditioned by spiritual values. I don't want to name too many of them because I think that gets into the area of personal belief, but you can recognize them by the quality of their thought. And by the nature of their world view. So we do reach out to the people of the UN and we find that many of them are very conscious of having a spiritual mission in the work they do. And they need our support. They are working in very challenging circumstances. And when you think about it, the people in the UN are on the front lines facing the most critical problems of human experience on a daily level. They need our support. <laughs> Let's look at life's lessons through the lens of Alice Bailey's writings and start off with that one question that's a cliché, but what is life and why are we here? That's certainly the big question, isn't it? The best I can say is that we are here to develop a consciousness of relationship. We're told in the writings of Alice Bailey that we live in a solar system, in a universe that is governed by the second ray of seven rays, the second ray being the ray of love. And this is working out in human consciousness as it evolves, as a sense of relationship, of being a part of something much greater than an individual self. And the whole progress of the spiritual path for anyone is to steadily accept expand the consciousness to understand or incorporate larger and larger awareness of a wholeness which if you are religious you call God. If you're not religious you might refer to it as a basic energy but we are not isolated islands. We are living fragments of a deity which is can only be described as a synthesis, a wholeness. This realization comes very slowly and only over time and evolution. It's not something you can just sit in a corner and figure out after a little bit of effort. It's an evolutionary progression. We see it as something that cannot occur in one lifetime. That's why the idea
idea of continuity of life is so fundamental to uh, the ageless wisdom that saying you only go around once not so in my opinion we have lived and will always live but in a developing sense and each time with a greater sense of um, awareness of our life being a mere fragment within a larger whole that's the best i can put it romantic love does alice bailey have any theories as to why at certain points in our lives we find ourselves deeply connected to a stranger i suppose she would say there's an, a sense of affinity or affiliation on the level of the soul and probably that's true that when we meet people whom we haven't known before but we sense a, a connection with them if it's an enduring relationship it's going to be something that is a link between souls if it's a passing of that comes and then dissipates she would probably say it was the harmony between two personalities so the depth is measured uh, in terms of its ability to endure or not but we are more harmonious with some people than others according to our psychology and our ray makeup the seven rays that govern all forms of manifestation power love intelligence harmony knowledge devotion and and uh, order or organization these are all different lines of development that we are synchronized with our fellow human beings depending on how they are conditioned by them if we believe for example that we are a second ray soul we're probably going to find ourselves responding to other people who share a similar conditioning i listened to one of your audio newsletters wherein the speakers discussed nourishment Almost at the conclusion of the presentation, the gentleman made remarks about the overpopulation of the planet. He said something to the effect that we should employ kind and gentle measures to control our world population instead of experiencing a more harsh solution from Mother Nature. Then he left it at that and left me wanting for more. <laughs> so it, it begs the question, what is the Lucius Trust position on how, we, how and why we should control the world population? We don't really have a formal policy or point of view. The implication of that statement you just read is that Mother Nature takes care of overpopulation through famine, through war, through uh, uh, all kinds of natural disasters. But war isn't really Mother Nature. Yeah, but the implication is that if we don't take care of overpopulation, other circumstances will do it for us. But I personally think that anyone living in the West, and particularly in a developed country like the United States, had better be very cautious about judging overpopulation and saying, well, look, our society, we only have 2.1 children, whereas other societies have 6 or 8. A child born in America is going to consume far more of the world's resources than a child born in a developing country. And so we can't just say other countries need to cut back on their population. If we aren't also doing something about our overconsumption of the planet's resources, doesn't the United States consume something like 25% of the world's resources? And we're only a small, what, 5% of the world's population? That's terrible. I think that's the point we should focus on and not overpopulation. Did Alice Bailey have any particular views on the prophets who have come into the world throughout history? As I recall from her writing, she viewed them as forerunners who are the advance guard, we could say, bringing teaching or sometimes warnings. Uh, for example, Isaiah in the Old Testament, some of the Old Testament prophets. Nowadays, I think the prophets are coming more in group form and we see them active in the world through just about every area of human experience. They're the people who have an insight into the developing trends of the world and can help to warn and guide humanity. You can hear their voice in economics, in science, in religion, in education, in culture. They're the forerunners and they're trying to chart a new course for humanity. Their voice is becoming more and more prominent, 
I think, and thanks to modern technology, more universally accessible. But is it not so that Lucius Trust, Alice Bailey, was looking for specifically the prophet Maitreya? The Maitreya is a being, an entity that is expected by the Buddhists. It's the reincarnation of the Buddha as the world teacher, the final Buddha, he whose name is kindness, we're told. And he's expected as a an avatar to lead humanity forward into the next stage of human evolution. The Ageless Wisdom views the Maitreya as the Buddhist understanding of the same concept that the Christian views as Christ, that the Hindu understands as the Kalki avatar, the Jewish person looks for the Messiah. It's the world teacher, and the writings of Alice Bailey say this entity will come, this time for the whole of humanity, not for any particular group, but for the whole. Were there not specific dates? I can't bring to mind a gentleman who was, I guess, the... PR person for the coming of the Maitreya, but he had some specific dates out there, and unfortunately, it, it never materialized. No, Alice Bailey has never set a specific date. It's forecast that this world teacher will reappear sometime in the 21st century, but I think the conditions have to be created by humanity. She spells this out quite clearly in her book, The Reappearance of the Christ, that before this world teacher can return, Turn, there has to be a true sharing of resources on the part of humanity and the growth of goodwill in the world. And as well, we have to see some signs that the political and religious systems are willing to clean house. And I think we can certainly look at what's going on, say, in the Catholic Church and in the political field and realize that there is house cleaning going on. And that's all very positive. But a true sharing we have to demonstrate a greater growing goodwill. I think it's coming. When you look at the response, say, to the tsunami in Southeast Asia, to Haiti, to Japan, to the victims of Katrina, we do see a growing sense of sharingness and compassion. So we're getting there. But those are the conditions humanity has to provide before, to put it frankly, it would be worth the time and energy of the world teacher to reappear. Who was this gentleman that was predicting the dates and how did he get into the mix and some kind of association with Lucius Trust? He's never been associated with the Lucius Trust. Um, you're speaking of Benjamin Krem, and we have no involvement in his work, nor he in ours. What is expected to happen when the Maitreya returns? If we see this as a continuity that was last embodied in the person of the Christ 2,000 years ago, at that time he anchored an energy of love that had never before been present in the human experience. He was the embodiment of perfect divine love. We're told that when this entity, this avatar, returns, that he will bring humanity a new understanding of the spiritual will. And I find that fascinating to think about. We feel so helpless and so befuddled about finding a resolution of human problems. And the idea that this new understanding or this new energy of the spiritual will will be anchored in the world when the avatar returns is, I find, enormously hopeful and positive. But first, we have to demonstrate that the energy of love is sufficiently anchored in human consciousness to make us able to bear a greater spiritual will. You can imagine a powerful will without sufficient love would be wrongly used. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy having their conscience seared with a hot iron, 